Okay, so uh, I did my capstone on uh, YouTube use in the classroom. And uh, before I start, I'm just going to uh, position myself as a researcher. So um, I'm in the science and technology stream in the MITL program. Before this, I did an undergraduate degree in forensic science. Uh, and most recently, start as of Tuesday, I'm also now teaching math, which is fun. Um, most of my school education, I uh, went to French immersion for a few years, up until grade four, and then I went to a gifted school, which was English. Um, so my schooling is primarily English, from Ontario, uh, around Toronto, and uh, I'm teaching English as well. Um, as far as my personal interests go, uh, I think I sort of pursued science in post-secondary because I was interested in a lot of things, and I figured that um, you know I had interests in art, music, and also in uh, politics and um, different areas of sort of progressive organizing, and I figured that these were things that I would probably do on my own time, whereas science and tech I wouldn't actually have a, the opportunity to do on my free time as a extracurricular. So I pursued it in school, but I sort of found myself um, not as interested in how detached I found the sciences. I found that they weren't uh, as socially aware as I would have liked them to be, and I found that it really had no connection to my everyday life. And so I graduated, I worked in a laboratory for about a year, and I really, actually it was only six months because I hated it that much, and I decided to do this program because I thought maybe I would be able to mix my interest in uh, social aspects with science if I was in a teaching profession. Uh, I also have a personal interest in YouTube, uh, mostly because I have a younger brother, he's six years younger, um, six and a half, I guess he's, a, he's 19 right now, and he is obsessed with YouTube. And when I moved away from university, he would have been 12, and I had kind of, um, before I moved away, I would take care of him a lot, because, um, for a variety of reasons. But um, when I, I always thought of him as sort of like my little project, and so everything that I liked he would like, and, and uh, I would always be interested in new things, and I really felt, um, you know, I felt a very kindred spirit with my brother, and then when I moved away, I found myself having less and less of a connection with my brother, and less of an influence on, let's say, perhaps his social choices. And I found that he got into sort of a rabbit hole with YouTube, and it mostly started out from watching just sort of interesting fact videos. So he would watch Vsauce, uh, he would watch uh, some of the other vloggers that were just talking about interesting phenomena. And from that it sort of spiraled into this weird rabbit hole where the things he would be watching, I would be listening, I'd be like, this is really bad what these people are saying. And I would look at his history and he'd be drawn to these really um, divisive or um, potentially harmful or discriminatory videos based on these, these recommended videos that are used from the YouTube algorithm. And so a lot of the behaviors that I was seeing in my brother that I wasn't so happy with, I saw this connection to this platform that he was using primarily for entertainment, and it was his primary source of entertainment. He wasn't really watching TV as much as he was sitting down in the basement watching YouTube videos. And so I thought this was really interesting. And when I started teaching, or going into my stages, I noticed that a lot of the teachers would say, okay, well, uh, one of the ways that I engage kids, like, you know, how, you're just starting off. How about you lecture for a half an hour and then maybe throw on a YouTube video? And I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't really know how much I like this idea. I, I don't know how much I feel like this is actually teaching the kids. And I'm also concerned about a lot of the content that's on here. And so I decided to look at YouTube as uh, my capstone project and see what kind of use it was getting in the classroom and uh, what sort of recommendations I thought that could be made. So um, a background study as to why YouTube is something worth looking at. Uh, we know that our students are really intertwined with technology more than they ever have been. When I was in high school, I didn't have a phone, and I would say maybe 25% of kids in my school did. Now virtually every student has a phone. Um, we also know that educators are under more pressure to incorporate technology in the classroom. One of the professional competencies is integrating information communications technology. So we have this big push to incorporate technology to stay relevant. There's a lot of tools that have been made for this effect that are not only for teachers, but also for students. So some of the ones for teachers that I'm sure most of us are familiar with are Kahoot, Schoology, and Google Classroom. And students are using things like uh, Duolingo, I myself have, uh, VIP Kit or VIP Kit, 
and uh, TED. There's also, of course, uh, Khan Academy, other sort of extra uh, curricular resources that students are using to learn because they're not getting, or they're, they're not feeling they're getting enough from the classroom. So the focus of my project is to look at the impact of the digitalization of education, uh, particularly using online educational videos in the classroom. Going into what YouTube is, it's a video sharing platform that was launched in 2005. It's actually now owned by Google. It has been for quite a while. When it started off, it was independent, but now it's owned by Google. Um, I would classify it as a form of entertainment, but also as education, news, and social media. There's a comment section, there's most recently community section, so there's a lot of interactions that are happening on YouTube, uh, which would classify it as a social media platform. It is free to use, it mostly runs on advertisement re revenue, but there also is now a subscription package, so YouTube Premium, where there's premium content that is coming from YouTube, as well as the option to skip ads. Um, it is the second most popular site in the world, and one billion hours of content are watched each day. I think that one of the reasons it's important to study it is because 90% of youth aged 18 to 24 use it, and 36% of them use them every day. And this is a study done in 2015. I can only imagine the number has gone up. Uh, it's also relevant to students. If they're using it at home, then if they're seeing it in the classroom, that there's some sort of connection there that I think uh, can be drawn. And it's a free resource available for teachers. So teachers are able to actually use this in the classroom as a visual aid, but also as a, a way of showing something that might not be feasible to take students to. So say, uh, if you're teaching them about history, you can show them things in other countries where you wouldn't be able to necessarily take them on a field trip there unless you teach at a really ritzy school. It is uh, multimodal and it's engaging because it's got a bunch of different ways that, you know, it's designed to keep people's attention, right? And so that can help if you're in a classroom and you want to keep students engaged in something and not perhaps being um, disruptive in the class. And it can also be used sort of as a virtual field trip. Some of the benefits that have been shown uh, through different scientific studies, uh, videos are able to arouse emotional responses in both hemispheres of the brain. Uh, they can be used as culturally responsive teaching. So if, uh, you know, if you're teaching a group of students that you might not share a cultural background with, you can use resources that have similar cultural backgrounds to these students and be able to speak to them in perhaps a way that you couldn't. Uh, the combination of audio and visual components increases memory recall and is useful for differentiation, particularly with autistic students or students on the autism spectrum. Uh, this can be a really useful way of having them be able to remember things. Uh, there's less gatekeeping on online communities, so because anyone can post a video to YouTube, it means that you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to have spent money and had a, a specific education in order to be involved in these communities. It's available to everybody. Uh, there's a space for alternative sources of information and critical discourse, so because it's not mainstream media, there is that ability for different points of views that may be suppressed by mainstream uh, media to be shared. But of course, that comes with the caveat that there may be things that are being shared that are perhaps untrue or uh, potentially harmful. And there's a participatory factor to YouTube. So the ability to be able to comment to videos, to be able to talk to video creators, to be able to upload your own videos, lends itself to a more participatory culture than just simply lecturing to people as I'm doing to you right now. Some of the potential pitfalls of YouTube are that there have been studies showing educational technology can actually fracture attention and reduce reading comprehension. So the way that we read digitally is not the same way that we read on paper. And there's actually many studies that show that comprehension is affected by reading things on a screen versus reading things physical copies. Uh, increased screen time can negatively impact critical thinking skills and increase passivity. And what I mean by passivity is just sitting down and taking things in instead of actually acting or um, collaborating in learning. It has shown to have a significant impact on mental health. And there's also limited representation of diverse identities on YouTube. Um, there, most of the content that you'll find is by similar sources that you, so, so even though YouTube could be this great thing because anyone can post to it, you'll end up finding that the most popular videos are generally by people who aren't in the margins of society. Uh, YouTube's recommended video algorithm also favors sensationalist fringe videos that are often inaccurate and or discriminatory. Um, I could 
give many examples, but I'm not going to go into it because I would like to move on to the next, the part of my study that I actually did. And there's also uh, the consequence of the privatization of education. So if students are able to just go to Khan Academy or go to TEDx or TED, uh, the, the normal TED website to look at videos, then what's to stop, uh, what's to stop them from, I mean, obviously this is, this is sort of an extrapolation, perhaps a, a bit, um, a bit of an exaggeration, but I mean, if there is this privatization of education happening, then it's devaluing the work of teachers, right? So we have to be mindful that if, if we're saying, okay, there's these great resources that you can pay for, then what's the point of having a public education system of, if there are these uh, private resources available that are paid? So what I decided to do was to carry out a study that would be able to determine, A, the current usage of YouTube in the classroom, B, how these videos are actually being selected by teachers. C, how teachers feel about YouTube when they're using it in the classroom and what observations they've made. And lastly, to identify potential benefits and concerns of YouTube as a pedagogical tool. What I did was I made a questionnaire that I hosted on Google Forms and I decided to sample teachers that were currently enrolled in education programs with at least three months of teaching experience. I distributed my questionnaire through uh, the McGill Graduate Educational email lists. I also posted it on my courses and I spread the, new, the, the good word through word of mouth. And my questionnaire used Likert scale, scale questions, multiple choice questions, and a short answer section. When I finally had my results, I used the uh, <coughs> T-squared and T-test analyses for testing statistical significance. So now on to my findings. The majority of my participants were younger than the age of 30, which makes sense because my sample were people currently enrolled in educational programs. But I did have a range uh, from 22 years of age to 59, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, experience correlates to my age, so the range was two months of experience to 30 years. And 60% of my participants had less than five years of teaching experience. Uh, for subject specialty, I had a pretty good split. Um, obviously, math is underrepresented, but there were less, um, especially in our year, I know, uh, less math, uh, math teachers than some of the other sections. Um, so what I decided to do was I sort of lumped together math and science, and then I grouped together uh, second language education, language arts, and social studies at ERC. Uh, student level, most of my participants taught secondary school, uh, overwhelmingly, three quarters, uh, but some were teaching adult and some were teaching uh, elementary. Okay, so now onto the questions that are actually about YouTube. Uh, I asked how often teachers show YouTube in the classroom. Uh, it's a little difficult to see on the screen, but only 2% used it every day, and then uh, 33 used it several times a week, 27 used it once a week, 22% used it several times a month, 7% used it once a month, 5% used it less often than once a month, but more than never, and 4% used it never. Uh, what this sort of translates to, or the takeaway that I took from this, is that 62 participants use YouTube at least once a week, which I think is a pretty significant amount. Then on to the uh, Likert, scale que Likert scale questions. Uh, I asked, students are more engaged in the lesson when watching videos than when I'm teaching using other methods. Mo the, the, the average answer for this was between neutral and agree, so mostly positive sentiment. Most people found that students are more engaged watching YouTube than perhaps other methods, although you know, there were still people that disagreed with this statement. Uh, students are less disruptive when watching videos than when teaching with other methods. Uh, vast, or not vast, but the majority of people agreed with that. There were some neutral and some disagreed, but the average answer again was leaning towards agreeing. Uh, I asked if the teachers were using it to complement teaching methods rather than supplement. So most people agreed that they were using it alongside other teaching methods, so they wouldn't use it to teach the content, they would just use it as an example. And most people disagreed that they were using it to teach the content. So they were saying, I usually teach it and then I use this as perhaps a visual aid. Um, I don't just use it to teach the kids 
the, the topic so I don't have to. I then asked how they felt about YouTube. So I said, uh, the statement was, I believe that videos enrich the classroom experience. Again, participants overwhelmingly agreed with this statement. And then I asked the opposite, believing that videos detract from the classroom experience. And we saw that most participants disagreed with the statement or were neutral. I then asked, how often would you like to be using it? Would you like to be using YouTube more often than you do? And this was a very nice average spread, which indicated to me that people mostly felt neutral about this question. So most people are pretty happy with the amount uh, or the frequency with which they're using the tool. Then I wanted to ask, how are you actually selecting videos? Are you critically analyzing the videos that you're using? So I asked, how important is diverse representation of the presenter of that video? So for example, gender, race, or nationality. People tended towards saying that they found it somewhat important to very important. So the average answer for this was, uh, was leaning towards the positive side. But when I asked about uh, diverse perspectives, so do you want to have multiple viewpoints, um, people seem to think that this was more important than diverse representation. So if you compare the two graphs, you can see that we have more answers in the higher end of the scale questions, so somewhat important and very important. If we now go to how important is the validity of the information, we see that this is by far the thing that teachers found the most important when selecting videos. They want to be selecting videos that are true and accurate. And when I asked how important is the validity of the source or the channel, so would you go back into the past and see what kind of content they're usually producing to perhaps see if there's a spin on the content or perhaps be able to fact check where they're coming from, people found that this was important, but again, less so than just the accuracy of the video that they're showing. Uh, so I used a statistical, statistical significance of 0 0.05. Um, I found that there was no significant difference between any of the questions based on age or years of experience, which was somewhat surprising to me. Um, there was also, uh, but there was a significant difference between subject specialties. So for the most part, answers were pretty much the same through all the different demographics. But for three specific questions, there was a significant difference between the languages and social science teachers, and the math and science teachers. So the first is for, I believe, that videos enrich the classroom experience. Math and science teachers felt statistically, more significant, statistically significantly more for this question than the languages and social science, which would indicate that math and science teachers find YouTube to be more enriching than uh, language and social science teachers. The next was how is important is diverse representation. The language and social science teachers found it to be more important than the math and science teachers. And same with the next question, how important are diverse perspectives? Again, languages and social science teachers found them to be more important at a statistically significant level than the math and science teachers. I then asked them, what kind of challenges have you uh, seen when you're using YouTube? Uh, teachers would say that the overall, well, the overall um, most, the most challenges that they've had with it include off-topic content or behavior, a lack of student interest or not being able to grab students' attention, uh, finding videos that are of appropriate length or are actually relevant, finding appropriate videos in general, uh, too many commercials, technical limitations, age appropriateness, so a lot of the videos were much too advanced or perhaps much too juvenile. Um, sharing of personal information, so some teachers were complaining that if they were logged in, their video history would show up and they didn't like that. And then the quality of video itself. I then asked for any additional comments. Um, I've pasted some of the ones that I find to be the most grabbing to me, so one of them was uh, I think videos are a great complement to teaching, not just a visual picture, but a live one. To see how things work, operate, take place, move, shine, live and die, etc. It's like taking a field trip in class. This came from a science teacher, and I think this perfectly exemplifies why uh, science teachers or science and math teachers in general found YouTube to be more useful of a tool than perhaps social science teachers, because there is that um, 
lack of, of resources to be able to show, you know, when you're teaching something that's a, a very intangible concept, it can sometimes be easier to demonstrate what is happening than to have, uh, to, to just be explaining it verbally. So I thought this was a, a good exemplar of why we see that really strong appreciation for YouTube from science and, uh, you know, particularly science teachers, although I'm sure math teachers as well. On the contrary side, from a math teacher, somebody said, I feel like in math YouTube, it's used to undermine the teacher, i.e., I can't learn from my teacher, I'm going to watch YouTube explanations instead. It lacks the opportunity for interaction and to ask questions. It builds a false confidence of knowing the material. And I think this, this really does exemplify one of the big problems with YouTube, is that if you go to any of the math YouTube videos, you see all these comments that say, oh, you saved my life, my math teacher can't explain it to me. There really is this devaluation of the work of teachers that you see on these videos. And that sort of ties into the privatization of education that I was talking about, and some of the problems that I do have with this platform as a pedagogical tool. And then lastly, somebody said, I've seen teachers that use YouTube as a replacement for reading out loud or reading altogether, and I don't think that's something the teacher should encourage. I believe videos should be a part of a balanced approach in which other formats are used. I had a lot of participants that had a similar sentiment, which was, I like using YouTube, but I like using it in a balanced way. And I thought that this comment really summarized uh, the majority of responses I saw that said, I've seen problems with YouTube, but I think it can be used appropriately. Lastly, what I did is I looked at all of the comments and I coded them into keywords, and then I looked at the frequency of each keyword to find out what are the what are the themes that are being brought up most often in my survey responses. Uh, of course, no comes up first just because it's a, it's a word that's commonly used. But if we look at some of our other keywords, we have appropriateness, engagement, advertisements. Relevance, uh, passivity, accessibility, finding, disruption, length, and balance. I'm not going to read them all out, but I thought that those were the ones that really stuck out. So one of the ones that I think is really key is this idea of passivity. So a lot of uh, teachers were saying, I don't like when I put a video on because the students are just sitting there and they're watching it and they're not engaging with the material. And I think it also ties into the idea of that relevance and, and, and that balance that, we, that we're trying to find when we're using this and perhaps, uh, perhaps not finding all the time. So if I look at my findings, uh, obviously I found out that YouTube is used often, like quite often, in the classroom across all ages and all subjects. Um, generally, most of my participants felt pretty positive about YouTube as a pedagogical tool. Uh, math and science tend to, teachers tend to value YouTube more and value diverse representation and viewpoints less than language and social science teachers and that the accuracy of the content is the most important factors that teacher, the most important factor that teachers have when they're choosing their YouTube videos. What I think is really important about this is when we think of the resources that we use in our classroom, for example, textbooks. Textbooks have to go through so much review and uh, you know, there's so many people that are working for it and there's so much debate over which textbooks we should be using in the classroom and a lot of research goes into making sure that the textbooks we're using have been reviewed and have the content that we need. But YouTube is being used by you know, the, the vast majority of my participants, probably a majority of teachers, and quite often without any review. So I think what we need to look at is how is it that we can use this tool appropriately and, and what can there be in place to help us make uh, positive choices when we're using this tool. Some of the limitations of my study uh, was a preliminary step survey and it had very surface level questions. Um, I didn't ask a lot of questions in depth. One of my biggest problems with it is I said, you know, how much do you value diverse representation? And of course, most people are going to say, oh, yeah, I value it. I should have asked, how are you ensuring that you value diverse representation when you're choosing videos, right? Um, same with how do you check the validity of the content? How do you know that what you're showing is accurate? So I think I really need to go more in depth in the actual questions to ensure that people who are saying they're doing this are, are doing so in a meaningful way. I also had a relatively short or small sample size. It was 60 participants. I would have liked to have more uh, participants and from a larger sample pool. So because I was only looking at teachers that were enrolled in education programs, I was really lacking the perspective of 
uh, teachers who maybe haven't been in school in a long time and perhaps aren't using technology as much as uh, teachers who are really being encouraged to use it now. For future research, sort of the takeaway of this project and things that I'm still interested in continuing to research, I would like to use more in-depth questioning, asking the how questions. Um, I think this could be achieved through interviews or perhaps observations, so going into classrooms and seeing when we're using YouTube, how are the students acting? In a classroom that's using YouTube, in a classroom that's not YouTube, using YouTube, what are the results that we're seeing? Uh, also using different samples, and what I think is the most important is getting a more comprehensive review of the current practices and coming up with a list of best practices. Because I think having a video resource is something that would be incredibly useful and almost integral, especially now in today's age, to the classroom. But I think, you know, we're using these videos from a private company with its own agenda, with its own advertisement, from uh, sources that have not been reviewed, from sources who may be trying to dispel misinformation. And so we need to make sure that we're using this tool, or perhaps another tool that someone to develop, an educational video platform that you know, the students don't think is super lame, we need to ensure that we're using this in a meaningful way. So what I think is the next step with YouTube, or just videos in general, is coming up with best practices that teachers can use so that they are ensuring that they're picking videos with accurate content, and they're valuing diverse representation, diverse perspectives, and having the students be engaged in what they're learning rather than sitting passively, like I've made you do for the past 30 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, this is the end of my presentation, but I thank you all for sticking with me for so long. We are uh, done in three minutes, and thank you very much. <laughs> minutes left for question as Natalie mentioned. Yes. What's your experience in your internship by using YouTube? Like what is how did you like what did you do to get them engaged or have you used it or Yeah so like what I've been sort of trying to do is if I'm using a video I like I, I spend a lot of time choosing what kind of video I want to show. Um, I've mostly only been using it in science classes and so usually what I'm doing is putting it on to show um, some sort of phenomena that I can't explain, but I'm giving them a, a sheet and I'm getting them to answer questions and then we talk about the video afterwards. Okay. So that's what I'm trying to do. I've been trying to choose, like I've been trying to be conscious of like the people that I'm showing on the screen and, and uh, the spin that I put on the information and then talking about it saying, you know, where do you think this, this came from? So, so trying to have sort of a, a meta conversation about the video afterwards, just to ensure that like, you know, we're supposed to be teaching our students about digital literacy and media literacy, and so I think like talking about it uh, com comes into play with but that. Would you ever do like, the research on the YouTuber yourself? Like the YouTuber, not the content, but the, the people making the video? Yeah, I mean like, I have, there, like, there are certain people that I avoid because I don't particularly like them or like uh, the content of their videos. A lot of the time I'll just use things that are like, you know, this was an old PBS documentary or, or something like that. Um, so I, I do usually like very basic surface level preliminary research and then if I you know, ever hear something bad about someone, I'm like, okay, you're on my blacklist, you're not, you're not going in my classroom. Um, but I would definitely like to do more. And you know, this is something I'm actually quite interested in and I would love to, to, to see a list of best practices made be that my own researcher or someone else's. Yeah. Um, so I assume that most of the, um, the participants in your survey were MATL students. Um, what do you think are the key differences between the results from us and say if you were to survey teachers that have like, been in the field for like 10 years, say? Yeah, I think like I sort of would have expected that YouTube would be used more often by like a younger demographic, but I remember being very surprised in my first internship, you know, one of the first things my CT says is, oh, why don't you put a YouTube video in? And it was often showing videos. So it's the sort of thing where I, I would like to have that data. I, I would expect it, like even given, even though my results didn't show an age difference uh, that was statistically significant, I would kind of still expect there to be more usage um, by people that are currently MATL students or, or a younger demographic in general. Um, but I also kind of wouldn't be surprised if uh, a lot of the, you know, boomer teachers were using it too. Because I mean, like, it's a popular resource, you know, it's popular among a lot of de demographics. And even when I was in school, like, my teachers were showing me Bill Nye videos all the time, right? Like, I'm sure they're like, hey, wow, I can just find this on YouTube now, that, that rocks, right? So I think the idea of showing videos in the classroom um, is not a new one. 
So, so, um, but yeah, I would be interested to see that. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you. Before you go, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate all of you, but just wait, I don't want to be on tape. <laughs>